Hello, everyone. This is Tuesday Night Rheumatology. Welcome to our event where we're going to replay some of our content from Room Now Live held in March a few months ago. Tonight, we're devoting the Tuesday Night Rheumatology session to a replay of advances in psoriatic arthritis. I want to thank the sponsor of this particular pod and uh, the Room Now Live uh, sponsorship from AbbVie. Um, they sponsored us during the meeting and are sponsoring this replay of the psoriatic arthritis content. I hope you enjoyed last week's TNR. We're going to be doing sort of weekly segments or sessions from Room Now Live devoted to this particular disease. So tonight we'll be talking about psoriatic arthritis. Next week we'll be talking about um, ankylosing spondylitis, spondyloarthritis. So with that said, it's about time to get started. We'll um, take that one down and we're going to start. Our program um, has three great speakers, um, Dr. Artie Kavanaugh, Dr. Bruce Kirkham, and Dr. Alexis Agdi. Here we go. We're gonna start with Dr. Artie Kavanaugh. Uh, familiar with. And when we first did the GRAPA, this is a group research and assessment of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, a group of uh, international uh, rheumatologists and dermatologists. We followed that process. And this is these are the guidelines that we came up with then. And you can see how old these are because there's so many things that are not on there. Biologics is TNF back in the day. Um, and yet we use that old process to come up with these. And there was certainly good evidence or reasonable evidence for many of these interventions. We also at that time came up in psoriatic arthritis to say, well, there's differences across different domains. So we came up with a structure where you would in a way dissect psoriatic arthritis into the relevant domains and then pick the therapies that fit with that. So in those days, you could say, well, how did you know your guideline or your recommendation was good? Well, there's the agree instrument. And there's a lot of people sit around thinking about how best to make guidelines. Uh, and some people came up with these. A lot of these are uh, uh, Canadian investigators. And they're just the kind of general, I mean, these seem, they all seem good. The scope and the purpose, the relevant stakeholders should be involved. It should be a rigorous uh, process. It should be clear. Uh, it should be ap applicable to the clinical situation. And from an ethical standpoint, the, uh, there should be editorial independence. So these were all very reasonable points that still actually hold true for any set of guidelines that you might see. Uh, but this has kind of evolved. The old guidelines, uh, I call them bog set guidelines. A bunch of guys sitting around a table and said, yeah, you know, here's an article on methotrexate. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I got, that works in the skin. Okay, check that box. And, you know, then, then go back and fill the agree instrument out afterwards to say, yeah, we check those boxes. Um, and you know what? They're still being used in this way, particularly for areas about which there's really very, very little evidence. And I've put a couple of them up here. This is a, the, these generate clinical care pathways. They're not saying that they're recommendation. They're just sort of saying this is an approach. Uh, this is uh, the uh, treatment of IBD in pregnancy critical care pathway from 2019, and also the clinical practice guideline from the management of osteoporosis, also in 2019. This is this kind of the same older way of literature review and evidence grading and recommendation creating that we had had um, since the 90s. This is still being used. There are different ways that people will talk about this. This is the sort process, strength of recommendation taxonomy. So as you see, this kind of looks familiar to the same processes that we'd had in the past, that we look for the evidence, good quality, patient-oriented evidence, all the way down to other evidence, including opinion and case studies, and giving you recommendations that then can be graded A, B, or C. And these were used by the National Psoriasis Foundation in um, the American Academy of Dermatology, NPF, guidelines for the treatment of psoriasis. Now, they had multiple uh, iterations of this in different populations, but here you see what you have for practical clinical scenarios and the strength of recommendation. So the more uh, common, the more things that have been studied, 
gets a higher level of a recommendation. So these kind of guidelines are, are still in existence. And there's another aspect of those that generated about five or six publications from the AAD NPF PSO guidelines. And here you see them here, including what you, should you do with uh, comorbidities. And they have sort of a clinical practice pathway, if you see, based on some evidence about what you would do in the presence of uh, particularly uh, uh, comorbidities that would increase the risk of MACE and how you would treat those. And these are actually uh, pretty reasonable, it seems, a bit aspirational, I think, for many of our dermatology colleagues who don't often get into the weeds about the comorbidities, such as risk for MACE events. But these have largely been supplanted by a process called GRADE. Uh, and here you see the kind of the, one of the original articles from this. This is from Gordon Guyad, also from McMaster. As I said, a lot of the people who've been in the evidence-based medicine field for decades were uh, uh, Canadian investigators. So what is GRADE and, and how did it all of a sudden become the absolute standard? Well, here's kind of the process for generating guidelines as you see here. So you do, you take the literature reviews and similar to how you had done in the past, you grade them. Um, the essential element of this though is the creation of the PICO, the population, the intervention, the comparator, and the outcome. So the great recommendations uh, actually work fantastic uh, in a very simple clinical situation, at least to my assessment. So if you have a hypertensive patient who also has diabetes, which is a better drug, an ACE inhibitor or a beta blocker? Well, you get all the studies and you do a pairwise comparison and you say, well, the population is as we defined it. These are the two interventions. They use the comparators that you have and what outcomes we would look at blood pressure control or other sequelae such as uh, outcomes like MACE outcomes. So you, you, you set up the PICO questions, which then is of course central to the whole process of grade. Then you get the, uh, the literature, rate the literature, take exogenous factors into account. What you end up with grade is recommendations, either recommendations for or recommendations against. And those can be either conditional or strong recommendations, again, based on the evidence. Uh, overnight, these really became um, absolutely standard that you see the, the, uh, the ACP, for example, American College of Physicians, has gone full bore with these, that this is the great process is the way to, uh, the optimal way to make recommendations. A difficulty comes with heterogeneous diseases and also in which there's a paucity of really good evidence across many clinical questions. And that certainly fits with psoriatic arthritis. With psoriatic arthritis, uh, you can't create, you can't boil it down to two by two tables because you would have literally thousands of two by two tables for the numerous therapies we have available to us now across the different domains of disease with consideration of some differences in the background of the affected patient. So it's been, it's a, a bit challenging to try to do that. So uh, let me show you a couple of examples where this has been, has been tried. Before I get that, actually here's my poll question. Which of the following describes how you mostly use treatment practice guidelines in your practice. A, I follow them closely and use them to help me decide what treatments. B, I'm aware of them. I use them to remind myself of possible treatment options. C, I use them to support a decision I already made, e.g. for the insurance company. Or D, guidelines. I don't need no stinking guidelines. So go ahead and vote and let's see what we have here. I'm aware of them and use them to re, uh, make myself avail, uh, uh, knowledgeable about p potential treatment options. Okay, interesting, nobody, nobody uh, said I don't use uh, treatment guidelines, at least as of yet. Follow them closely, this is like a horse race, I like this. Um, coming into the lead is follow closely. Uh, uh, but use them to support treatment decisions that I already made. So I think there's different ways to do this. And of course, I think these could all be a possible answer depending on the clinical scenario. The more evidence there is, the more you could say, well, the guidelines then are taking that evidence and it makes reasonable, uh, it, it makes reasonable sense that you would use that to actually support your treatment decisions.
So what about the, the guidelines that, uh, as we've had, and what about what's going on in psoriatic arthritis? So I showed you the very early GRAPA guidelines, which are very much based on sort of the older method, the, the old RAND UCLE method of uh, grading the literature. Uh, in 2015, we, we uh, redid these kind of tried to come up with more of a grade-ish sort of approach. But a difficulty is it's really quite hard to do that because you can't say uh, it, your, your treatment choice is not always drug A versus drug B. Um, there's A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, that's simplified somewhat by the approach to domains where we've already sort of gone through and um, you can make a case for not using certain options. For example, for axial disease, you could say uh, that there's not at present evidence for uh, IL-1223, which here it was up in the air, this is back uh, a few years, um, or an IL-23 inhibitor, but there was data for TNF and for IL-17. Uh, these are the older ones. And these are still mostly old-timey, although sort of grade-ish. And you can see, my gosh, how out of date they are because of all the things that we're missing. So I'll show you the updated version, uh, at least a draft of the updated version coming up. So these were sort of grade light, if you will, in, in how they were done. The ACR, along with the NPF, did uh, guidelines, and the, the, they used the grade process. They went full in for the grade process, and uh, what that does is it puts a lot of things sort of head to head, or at least they tried to follow the grade uh, recommendations. Interestingly, there's almost nothing that was a strong recommendation. Almost everything was a conditional recommendation, except to not smoke, and I think they sort of made that up because there's no data that uh, really suggests that if you're a smoker, and you stop, it's uh, going to result in, in clinical changes. But be it as it may, that was a uh, strong recommendation. Everything else was fuzzy, but they did follow the grades outline and um, stuck to it very closely. So they ended up with several sorts of, of clinical scenarios. Uh, they defined the population and said that this would be uh, patients with severe psoriatic arthritis based on these, which are reasonable, but of course, nothing can be purely grade because severe is in the eye of the beholder. These make absolutely complete sense. These are very reasonable, but um, these are not based strictly on evidence saying that this is more severe than that. But these are, uh, I think the, the idea was that these are the patients for whom we want the uh, most support where we're trying to make clinical decisions. And they have, uh, uh, and I think you have seen these, that last was the actual, uh, the publication, but just making it a little bit more clear because it's just got sort of overwhelming. Um, recommendations for treatment naive uh, active psoriatic arthritis. So one of the things that in their estimation, looking at the literature, they came up with starting a TNF biologic over what they call OSM, which they, uh, it's a neologism of oral small molecule, uh, meaning methotrexate. So that the, in their estimation, you would start a TNF over an oral sm small molecule, um, you would start an oral small molecule um, over IL-17 inhibitor or a 12-23 inhibitor. Um, you would start methotrexate over non-steroidals, and you start an IL-17 over a 12-23. Uh, th so these these are things that they came by pairwise comparison of the two different classes, and that's kind of how the grade process does. Interestingly, now this has been sort of uh, reconsidered, particularly in light of the SEAM PSA study, which showed, although it didn't have a sleep placebo group to uh, really generate an effect size, it showed the methotrexate wasn't so bad. It seemed to work closely to the TNF inhibitor, in this case, the Tanercept, in that study. So these have been sort of have to be rethought. And here's the, the, just the next level, active despite oral small molecule, um, switch to a TNF over another molecule, as you can see. You can read these, and I think you have read them. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, there's some issues, I think, sticking closely to the grade process. That's Artie Cavanaugh. Uh, we want to thank Artie for that. Um, he goes on to talk about the um, ULAR guidelines, which have just been developed. Uh, Laura Coates is the author of that. You can 
uh, find Artie's uh, full lecture on the, the Room Now uh, website in the, in the coming days. And that will be, I think, a, a good resource. But I think this brings up the, you know, the issue of um, how we use guidelines and, you know, can they, are they helpful to us or not? One of the th comments that we got at the meeting was, you know, I'm concerned about these, that these are going to be used against me, either by insurance companies or by legal um, proceedings, so to speak. Uh, and I think that that's a concern, right? Um, but recognize they're already being used um, by insurance companies when it serves their interests. So that's why it's important to know what the ACR guidelines are doing, what the MPF is saying, what GRAPA is saying, um, because you can certainly then um, uh, help yourself in, in your deliberations. Um, when it comes to legal, everyone at the society level, whether it's the National Psoriasis uh, Foundation, the American College of Rheumatology, they always say the guidelines are not legal documents or not legally binding. They're a uh, distillation of the best current evidence um, which is to say that they, they're defending themselves saying, don't worry, it's not going to be used against you. But um, I think it's, it's possible they could be used against you, but really not. Because why? Artie pointed this out. He said that these are largely expert opinion, right? That, that these are mostly consensus. And, you know, there's a lot. We've talked about that here on Room, Room Now before, that when you look at all these guidelines, especially all the ACR guidelines, they're at least 70% um, conditional recommendations meaning that they're expert opinion. So uh, on that basis alone, you know, that's your defense against the legal proceedings. Um, I think I want to point out that the GRAPA guidelines are very domain driven, are they not? And that becomes important because that's kind of how you see the patients, meaning patients with predominantly skin only disease, patients with predominantly, um, you know, nail disease, patients with predominant uh, enthesitis or dactylitis. And that becomes important because now the companies are doing clinical trials to address each of the domains that GRAPA has identified. Uh, in the case of psoriatic arthritis, patients usually don't have one domain. They have three or four domains that are active at any one time. And it's only the worst of patients who actually have all the domains in play. Uh, hopefully um, that doesn't happen uh, too often. Um, and the last thing about these guidelines, whether it's ULAR, ACR, NPF, GRAPA, it's a moving target, meaning it's often interesting to those of us who look at them when they come out. It seems like are you, I can't believe that they actually included a drug that's not yet even approved for psoriatic arthritis, or they excluded a drug that is approved but doesn't have a lot of data. So it is a moving target, and, um, and hence they should inform your thinking, as I think most of you voted going forward. I want to, um, this is your opportunity to ask any questions. Um, during the session, you can ask questions using the Q&A box, and we'll discuss those. We're going to run through another uh, lecture. Our, our second speaker is going to be uh, um, Dr. Bruce Kirkham. Um, Bruce comes to us from um, uh, Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital uh, in the UK. Um, he is a professor of uh, translational rheumatology at King's College in London. And he's going to talk about uh, drug targeting in psoriatic arthritis. So let's talk about another patient. So this lady's had uh, definite psoriatic arthritis. She's had it for about 10 years. She's uh, been on methotrexate. She's for about seven years. She's been doing quite well, but she's developed some increasing neck pain, which she attributes to an injury she had four years ago, but it's very persistent. It troubles her quite often at night and in the mornings. And she noticed in the last six months, it's quite a lot more stiff, quite a high pain score. When you see her in your office, she's got some sort of slightly active peripheral arthritis, signs of enthesitis, particularly around the quadriceps and around the pelvis, which sometimes can be quite hard to tell clinically, but also her cervical spine has quite uh, limited movements. And, and you order an MRI and it shows um, active uh, changes in the spine here, which is almost looking a bit like they call the Anderson lesion, which is a sign of an inflammatory spondylitis. So the question is, again, I'm going to ask you, put your thinking caps on, and what treatment would you use for this lady who's been on methotrexate, has now not doing so well, and has uh, the symptoms of some peripheral arthritis, but also uh, spondylitis? 
So let's look forward to your answers. choices because really we want to give this lady uh, some sort of biologic therapy uh, and this is data from a sub-analysis of the spirit head to head study which compared uh, ixekizumab to adalutumab in patients with psoriatic arthritis. Some of them had methotrexate and some didn't. And if we look here at say the high end point of minimal disease activity, this is what I think is like remission. This is uh, ixekizumab much doing quite a lot better than adalutumab in patients without methotrexate. However, when we see the patients who had methotrexate, the, adult, the ixekizumab is still doing about the same, but we see an improvement in the effects of the adalimumab. If we look down here at the endpoint, which was this mixture of, of ACR50 and PASI100, again, we see the ixekizumab uh, significantly better than the uh, adalimumab without methotrexate. Whereas if we see the um, patients here who have adalimumab plus methotrexate, the difference is, is much more close. So it does suggest that the adalunumab and anti-TNF monoclonal antibody has better efficacy with methotrexate than without methotrexate. And so this is some interesting new data that can put into our, our formula when we're figuring out what drug for the right patient. Again, we have the data of upadacitinib, uh, the, the SELECT-1 study, which is patients uh, new to biologics. And we see here, this is the registered dose, the 15 milligram dose of upadacitinib compared to adalutumab in those studies. And we can see here that there's sort of similar outcomes across the board, maybe some slight differences, but if we look at the patients who achieved MDA, again, we have the same sort of similarity around here, uh, about, about sort of 38. So this is very useful data um, to help us get some idea of what the best treatment would be for which patient. And then other things like adverse event profiles and things can, can drive us. Whereas in the, also in the, uh, some, sense, some areas, cost is also a very important factor, especially in areas where you have uh, biosimilars. Enthesitis is a very important aspect of uh, psoriatic arthritis. Uh, and it also links to some of the questions I was talking about with the environmental stress, because as we know, the tendon uh, absorbs a huge amount of environmental stress, mechanical stress. There's also elements where the microbiota could have an effect. And where we can do this, this could actually cause activation directly by stimulating some of these lymphoid cells here um, in a very, in a direct stimulation. These are called innate immune cells, and they can sometimes respond directly to micro damage, uh, micro stress, and also environmental stress like infection. Um, rather than having to be driven by IL-23. And this is very important, and it does show that there's more than just the adaptive T cells. So these are the kind of cells we think are important sources of IL-17 in spondyloarthritis. We have the adaptive immune cells, we've got the CD4 TH17 cells, the CD8 TC17 cells, and some of them are TRMs, tissue resident memory cells. But we have all these innate cells, innate ILC3s, gamma delta T cells, the natural killer T cells and the mate cells, which um, actually call mucosal associated immune uh, T cells rather than uh, mate cells being discovered from Australia. But basically they all uh, uh, produce IL-17 and they don't have T cell receptors. So they probably have an important role and we're learning a lot more about them on a daily basis. Now we think one of the ways they might be helping us explain things is that um, IL-17 and TNF, both very important in spondyloarthritis um, and psoriatic arthritis, don't have direct inhibition by JAK inhibitors. Um, and this is a, a paper that uh, Leonie Tams and I produced recently where we showed that the cytokines like interleukin-9 and interleukin-17 could be inhibited by JAK inhibitors, and that would decrease activation of some of these innate cells here. IL-22 also could be inhibited by JAK uh, inhibitors which also may explain the secondary effect of improving disease activity. Now, of course, I mentioned before that IL-23 can be directly inhibited by JAK, but 
we know that IL-23 inhibition for the spine and spondylitis isn't that great, uh, but we also know that JAK inhibitors seem to be quite good for spondylitis. So some of these indirect pathways might be very important ways of explaining what's happening. So let's turn to our last patient. So this is a, a, a male age 43. He's a long-term patient with psoriatic arthritis. He had for many years. He's failed DMARS. He's failed a TNF inhibitor. He comes to see you and he's not feeling that great. He's had some previous abnormal liver function tests. He's got issues of mood. Um, he has psoriasis. He used topicals. And, and you're a rheumatologist. So, you know, we say, how are you getting on? How's the skin? Any problems? He says, it's okay. But when you see him in your clinic, you realize something's not quite right. He's got some, a couple of joints a bit swollen, but he's just not feeling so good about things. He might have slightly low mood, but is there another way you could find out what's happening? Um, what sort of things would you want to ask this patient and how might you find out what's wrong with him? So any suggestions would be welcome. Thank you. One of the things we want to find out, maybe is this person got problems with psoriasis he's not really talking about? So our quant rheumatologist, quantitative rheumatologist may use questionnaires. There's a very good one called the PSAID. There are other questionnaires specifically for skin, uh, which could be used. And they can sometimes find out things from patients who, who don't really like talking about things. Alternatively, the great thing about rheumatologists is we have a relationship with patients. So you could ask him, is the skin troubling him? You know, you might get this, well, maybe. Uh, and then you could be more specific. Do you have genital or, or psoriasis down below? Or some one of those other questions which we've all learned how to work out. And you sort of might get this, well, well, yes. And what you might be talking about here is high impact site psoriasis. So genital psoriasis is particularly troublesome, but psoriasis on the skin and particularly psoriasis on the hands. These are where the skin is not particularly extensive, but it really causes quite significant problems of quality of life. Now, particularly genital psoriasis is underreported, and in Europe, they actually have, they talk about some people who really report problems with psoriasis. These are people, they call it alexithymia. Uh, it's sort of like a personality type. They take, they do not complain about things, and sometimes they have to be sort of encouraged to, to really tell us, tell you what's wrong. So then we will have to look at patient drugs that are going to have a good effect on the psoriasis as well as joints. And this is where we're looking at the latest data from the Keepsake 2 study of Rizinkizumab in uh, biologic experience patients. And here we have the PASI-90. Now PASI-90 has become the new gold standard for patients with psoriasis ever since we had the IL-17 drugs. And we have a very good PASI-90 of 55%. But then again, the ACR-50 is 26%, which is not amazing. Now look, let's have a look at the UPA decitinib data. This is the select PSA2. This is in patients who had had previous biologic experience. And here we have the ACR, here we have the PASI-90. It's not as good. It's actually the PASI-90 of um, the UPA decitinib is about 38% compared to 55%. But then again, on the other hand, the ACR50, here it is here, it's actually 40%. So this is where you actually have to start having a conversation with the patient. What is the problem? How can we treat it? We've got something that's good for the joints or maybe better for the skin. And this is where we can start really choosing the right drug for the right patient. Patient has a really important role to play, but also alternative ways of treating different aspects of the disease. All right, so thanks to Dr. Kirkham for um, his session, which was about specifically targeting the immune response in psoriatic arthritis and showing you some of the data. Again, that's just an excerpt of his presentation. Uh, anyone has questions, please put it in the Q&A session. Um, uh, during that session, um, he showed us uh, uh, several trials that were head-to-head -head trials. And that's sort of the cool thing that's going on in psoriatic disease that's not necessarily going on in other diseases. 
and that is that we are seeing more head-to-head -head trials, which have had a dramatic effect on prescribing um, and uh, what drugs are, have become the standards in psoriasis management. Um, I think that they're starting to have an effect in rheumatology, but as he showed you the head-to-head -head trial of ixekizumab versus adalimumab, pretty impressive where, where um, we certainly know the IL-17 inhibitors, they're both good at arthritis, right? They're both really good um, in, in their own way at skin, but really the IL-17 inhibitors are way better than TNF inhibitors at skin. When it comes to joints, they're roughly about the same, but overall, looking at multiple outcomes, the ixekizumab was better than adalimumab unless you added methotrexate to the mix. If methotrexate was in the mix, then adalimumab and methotrexate is equal to ixekizumab. Um, and I think that we're gonna see more and more data that will influence uh, some of your thinking, uh, some of your impressions going forward. Um, the other thing about um, head to head and considerations um, for you in, in subsequent use and, and, and how you employ this, um, he said, I think rightly so, that it depends on what it is that you're looking for. Is efficacy, are the efficacy results going to drive your decision-making or might they have a better safety profile? This is a great example of this in RA. That's the select choice study of, of UPA versus Avatab, UPA, upatacitinib versus Avatacib in RA patients who failed multiple TNF inhibitors that UPA was better in, multiple, in most of the clinical outcome measures, the efficacy measures, but ABA was safer as far as number of adverse events. And the question is, which drives your decision-making? Is it the efficacy that the patient needs most or is the safety that they demand most? And that's sort of a, a really important thing. He, Dr. Kirkman pointed out that it's basically decision driven by either efficacy, safety, cost. I throw in there availability uh, and then lastly, whether or not there's a subset domain that's really driving the equation, like enthesitis or, or dactylitis. Um, so um, uh, John Oxley asked the question, do you hold more credence to a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, um, superiority trial, over open-label head-to-heads? Um, well, again, open label always takes a back seat as grade B evidence. It's just, you know, but it is head to head. But re remember when it's open label head to head and it's just two drugs and no placebo, you're escalating the results. So an example in RA um, is the head to head trial of sertolizumab versus adalimumab. Open label, everybody's getting, no, they know they're getting the real drug. Normally in a, TNF inhibitor add-on trial. It's a 60-40-20 ACR 20-50-70 response. In that trial, the people who responded had an 80% ACR 20 response. So you escalate the level of response, but you do get a comparator um, measure. Um, and that was supposed to have been a superiority trial. It failed. It was actually not inferior to each other. But uh, I, I think, yes, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trials is the grade A evidence as far as you know, when it comes to these guidelines and how you make decisions. But really, I do think that the, um, John, I think it really does boil down to head-to-head -to -head trials that inform your decision. And we talked a lot about head-to-head -head trials in the last month. We're talking about all psoriatic arthritis data. We had several journal clubs on that. And the question was, when do I use IL-17 and IL-23 inhibitors versus a TNF inhibitor? And it basically boils down to what the problem is that you're treating. If spondylitis is in play, you're not going to be thinking about an IL-23 inhibitor, although Philip Mee said, maybe psoriatic spondylitis, maybe there is a response there. You know, but if it's someone who has any GI involvement, you're going to be going with a 23 um, over a 17. If someone who's got a lot of skin and joint um, and it's not spondylitis, but it is psoriatic arthritis, you're going to be going with either a 17 and 23 over a TNF inhibitor because of the superior. So the idea is that the, the, the head, this head-to-head -head trial stuff does really color your thinking. The last thing about this session that I, I want to convey to you, this new audience to this, these presentations, is that there was a lot of discussion, a lot of questions about the point Dr. Kirkham brought up, and that is depression. It is the elephant in the room that we often have to deal with. Um, as you know, uh, patients with psoriatic arthritis are at higher risk for um, 
uh, depression. Uh, it was one of the big factors that kind of derailed Amgen as they developed bradaliumab. So we had um, Lilly developing uh, uh, ixekizumab. We had Novartis developing secukinumab. Amgen was developing bradaliumab, and they started asking a lot of questions, and they got a lot of answers back about depression and suicidality and all that kind of stuff. So they bailed on it, and it was bought by another company, and it's now available as Salik. But we know there's a depression warning even for Otesla, which I don't think any of these drugs constitutively worsen depression, but depression's a big player here. And one of the things that came out of the session was that the dermatologists are aware of this, the rheumatologists are aware of this, but are you screening for it? And I think that's a real big issue. Um, uh, Lake of Barbosa in the Q&A asked about maybe you should do a PH2 questionnaire, um, which is a, 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 an, an early way of looking for depressive symptoms. You could do a Beck inventory, a, a modified Beck inventory. But a lot of the doctors that were in audience at the Room Now Live session on psoriatic arthritis were, I think, getting around to the idea is we should be asking about depression. Either you outright ask, are you depressed? Have you thought about suicide? either on your survey form or during the visit, or you build into the questionnaires that you do some you know, modified, um, uh, some questions that can be easily incorporated into um, your practice. So uh, with no further questions, let's go on to our, our, our third presentation, which is um, uh, Dr. Alexis um, Agdi from the University of Pennsylvania, where she's an associate professor We've asked Alexis to talk about um, uh, real world evidence and registries in psoriatic. That's a lot. So what are some real world data examples? Um, this is from, again, from the FDA website. I thought it was nice to use their examples, but I'm gonna go through these each in more detail electronic health records, claims and billing activities, uh, product and disease registries, patient-generated data, including in-home use settings, and data gathered from other sources that it can inform healthcare, such as mobile devices. So we've talked about some examples of real-world data. How does this data become evidence? So what the FDA means by real-world evidence is that it's the clinical evidence that, about the usage and or potential risks or benefits of a medical product. And these are derived from these real world data sources. But this can also include randomized controlled trial data that's been reanalyzed in different ways, pragmatic trials, which we'll talk more about, and observational studies, whether prospective or retrospective. So why is this still important beyond the clinical trials that we see? So when we see clinical trials in psoriatic arthritis, let's say, they have the outcome of ACR20. ACR20 is not really a practical outcome for use in clinical practice. We don't use that. We don't look at these seven different elements and say, if you responded to these two, then we apply the next five. It's, it's not practical. But furthermore, if you look at an ACR20 response in someone who only has one, one swollen joint, you're really not going to ever achieve, you can't achieve a 20% improvement in one joint. So for that reason, the outcome measure alone is not really uh, specific to clinical practice. But in addition, in order to actually achieve an ACR20, you have to have patients coming into the trial that have high enough disease activity that they can actually change that much. So this leads to trials packed with patients that we don't see in clinical practice in general. They represent a very much small minority of the patients we generally see. So in uh, 2019, uh, Kurt Vlam and Rick, Rick Lorries and um, Vandendorp published this article on the evolution of patients in clinical trials. And I put this box around the swollen and tender joint counts. And here you see that the mean swollen joint count in these studies used to be 14 in period one, which is the beginning of the biologics area. And then it's still around 13 swollen joints on average in a clinical trial. And uh, as far as tender, tender joints, it originally was 24, 25, but we're still having about 23 swollen joints in these er, in tender joints in these clinical trials. So if you think about the last time you saw a patient with psoriatic arthritis who had 13 swollen joints and 23, 24 tender joints, um, we don't see many of that with that high level of disease activity. But that's the type of disease activity you have to have in these trials in order to see differences. 
So what does this look like in the real world? So these are two different real world co cohorts. Um, the first is the PARC data set, which is one I'll tell you more about. It's one of, it's our longitudinal cohort study at Penn, Utah, uh, NYU, and Cleveland Clinic. And then in addition, we have the core Evitas registry, which I'll also talk more about. And what you see is that among patients switching therapy in, in both of these studies, the mean swollen joint count was around three, and the mean tender joint count was around six. And in Coravitas, the mean swollen joint count was around three, and the mean tender joint count was around six or seven. So you can see that these populations are so very different from the populations enrolled in clinical trials. So this is why real world evidence has so much weight is that the real the data from the real world really reflects the patients we see, or ideally it reflects the patients we see. In general, real world um, populations have lower disease activity, um, more prior treatment, so they may be more refractory to care uh, to uh, new, new therapies, and then also more comorbidities and also likely less adherence because they're not coming into the trial to actually receive the medicines. So it's never really surprising when new drugs that looked fantastic in a clinical trial aren't performing quite as well in clinical practice. So now let's talk about each of the different types of real world data and what kinds of evidence we can draw from these. So first I'm gonna talk about uh, the population-based health studies. So when we talk about population-based, we think about um, Optum or other administrative data sets that might cover an entire population. So for example, um, all the patients enrolled in a specific insurance program within the United States uh, would, would cover across the United uh, would cover the United States in general. Um, and so we can generally look at a full population. You have to realize that each population has some differing aspects. So for example, in Optum, we have very small numbers of Medicare patients or Medicaid patients. It's largely commercial insurance covered patients. So we know that that patient population is gonna be different from some other patient populations, particularly Medicaid or Medicare when you look at them more broadly. Medicare is another population um, health uh, data set. So it's gonna cover all patients in the United States on Medicare and they're, they're generally 65 and older or on disability. So again, they're covering a portion of the population. It might not be totally generalizable to the whole population, but at least it's uh, generalizable to that population. Another example is the Health Improvement Network, or THIN, uh, and its cousin, the CPRD, which is the Clinical Practice Research Data Link. These are both electronic medical record databases within the United Kingdom. They cover large, generally representative practices uh, as they're delivering care. So like our EPIC, for example, in the United States, they have it across the whole health system and they can then have a representative section of the health system participating in these data sets. They're just extracting the data, cleaning it, and putting it into usable formats. So uh, electronic health records within our in own institutions are not necessarily generalizable in the same way, but there are conglomerates, for example, um, Optum EMR or Optum EHR data that will give, have groups of health systems across the country to make it more population-based. So these are some different things you think about when you're choosing one of these data sets. First of all, I might get large numbers, but what, who am I capturing and who am I not capturing? So I'm gonna give some examples of what kinds of data you might expect to get from this. Uh, this is a study recently published by So Young Kim's group in which she examined hospitalized severe and serious infection after ustekinumab or other biologics. So the goal here was to understand how ustekinumab compared to TNF inhibitors, for example, or IL-17 inhibitors in the risk for infection. So this is an ideal data set for this type of study in some ways, because you're gonna get large numbers of patients on these um, medications. In fact, you can see there are 123,000 patients with psoriasis and or PSA who initiated one of those drugs. And among that, you have 1,500 serious infections. So you can see when someone goes into the hospital in these, um, in these data sets, in some of these data sets, not all of them. But in this particular data set, I believe this is uh, market scan or one of the um, insurance covered databases. And so you can see generally who's going into the hospital. So we have good capture of outcomes. We know it's related to infection because of the coding for the hospitalization. And they've done validation studies to look at the code for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis to know um, or to make sure that we're actually studying the right population. And then with drugs, you actually know that they got the drug uh, 
because they, there was a claim paid for the drug. So we have good capture of how often people are taking these drugs. Um, I'm gonna come back to some other issues with comparing different drugs to um, one another in these types of data sets. But one of the nice perks of these databases is that you can get the large numbers needed to compare different therapies. Here's another example of a comparative effectiveness study by Jeff, Jeff Curtis's group. This is also a recently published paper in RMD Open, and it was comparative effectiveness of biologics and targeted therapies for psoriatic arthritis. And in this case, they compared to TNF inhibitors, and they wanted to know about effectiveness, which was actually kind of a complex outcome in which they based it on adherence, adding or switching a biologic or a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, adding a non-biologic disease-modifying agent, or increasing the biologic dose or PDE4 dose, or frequency in glucocorticoid use. So unfortunately, in most of these data sets, you don't get a clinical measure. In fact, you just don't. Um, you don't know for sure that this patient has responded or not. So we have to use these other clues that the patient is doing well. So that's one disadvantage is you have to kind of make up a, a rule for that. You can go validate that rule as well. So there's some, you know, some uh, ability to understand whether or not that's truly capturing it or getting a good sense of that. Persistence is one of those measures we sometimes use for comparative effectiveness. It's kind of a dirty outcome because people may stay on therapy because it's effective. They may stay on it because they can't get access to something else. They may come off of it because they just didn't like it. They had an adverse event or it didn't work. So you're getting a combined outcome in that case. So in this one, they compared this treatment effectiveness outcome that they defined among uh, the, the different medication groups. And you can see that compared to a TNF inhibitor, which seemed to be the most effective using their, their um, definition, uh, IL-12-23 had a hazard ratio, or a relative risk of 0.59, um, and IL-17 had a eight, uh, risk, relative risk of 0.89, although the confidence interval was not significant, and phosphodiesterase 4 was 0.79, and the confidence interval was significant. So it suggests that the TNF inhibitors were more effective than this particular case. So there's a lot of challenges in comparing two active therapies. And this is a particularly problematic in these types of data sets where you don't have any data about the disease activity. I'll tell you that even when you do have the disease activity, it doesn't make it a lot easier, it's just a little bit easier. So one of the reasons is that people get therapies for different reasons, and different therapies are prescribed for different patient populations. Even if you look at the GRAPA guidelines, you can see that certain therapies might work for certain uh, aspects of the disease, and certain people might not want a given therapy for some reason that they saw on TV that they didn't like, or a family history of some adverse event that they aren't interested in having, or uh, if you think the patient had, that patient has IBS and you're not sure if it's IBD, you might prescribe one therapy over another. So those things are often not captured because those are the things that we're talking about with the patient. And so the two populations end up looking quite different, but pre predominantly on the unmeasured things, they look very different. And so we have to think about ways of making those populations more similar. Propensity scores are often used in that way. So I won't go into detail, but there's a lot of methodologic concerns or, or, or considerations that you must employ when you use these large administrative databases, and that's where the epidemiologist and the biostatistician are really important in conducting these types of studies. So advantages of these different databases are that there's lots of patients cared for in the real world. In the EMR databases, you have an understanding of what uh, physicians are wanting to prescribe. Um, sometimes we send in a prescription and the patient never fills it. So the not filled prescription would not end up in the administrative database. And conversely, the physician trying to prescribe something that didn't get picked up or filled wouldn't be present in the administrative database. So in administrative data, you get a sense of the prescriptions filled and you can understand adherence a little bit about by how far between prescriptions someone picked up their next prescription. And then we have um, international data sets outside of the United States, like Sweden or uh, Norway, for example, they have uh, single health uh, care or single payer healthcare systems where you can get a lot of data about the patient all in one data set, which is really exciting. Um, in the United States, we're kind of doing much more patchwork when we're putting together data sets from the US. So some other limitations to think about when you're reading these studies of uh, administrative or EMR studies, we're relying on codes. We don't have things directly um, taken from the patient. We don't have patient reported outcomes in general. 
Um, so we have to make sure we validate those codes and we know exactly what we're looking at. In general, we're looking at associations, not causations. You can never interpret these studies causally. There's a lot of methods we can propose to, to try to do that, but none of them are perfect. There's observation bias potentially in that patients can be followed more closely for certain things. So I know psoriatic arthritis patients are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease, so I might follow them more closely. There's more misdiagnoses and um, because sometimes patients don't come into the doctor to get their, their diagnosis coded or, or the physician forgets to put it in. And finally, there can be missing data because these are open systems. Someone within, uh, especially for EMR data, so someone within our healthcare system where I'm capturing that data might go out of the system to a hospital nearby if they have a myocardial infarction and that might get completely missed. So these are all uh, important limitations. Well, thank you, Alexis. Um, it's really interesting um, in that there's a greater emphasis these days uh, from regulatory bodies, both in Europe and the United States, uh, that real world data um, registries and the different types of data sets that she talked about are taking on greater meaning. And in fact, are going to take on even regulatory meaning that, that they could be used not only to hurt a drug and take it off the market, but really to help put a drug on the market in the future, especially in conditions that are hard to study. Uh, and there certainly are many of those. Uh, and, and often studies aren't done because they're so hard to study, but yet you could collect, um, you know, my favorite condition, adult Stills disease. It's impossible to do a study in Stills disease, but if you had a registry um, and you designed the registry to collect data prospectively, you could certainly get real world data that could end up becoming uh, important. So I, again, I think the regulatory impact of real world data, real world, uh, um, experience is um, important in many different ways. I like that she began with a very clear um, data showing that patients in the real world are not the patients in the clinical trials. In PSA, they have oligoarthritis with three swollen joints or less. In the clinical trials, they've got, you know, six to 12, you know, swollen, uh, actually more than that, more like 14 to 12 swollen joints um, and a polyarticular presentation. Most of the drugs that have been approved for psoriatic arthritis have basically been done on polyarticular patients. Yet, can we apply those to our patients with oligoarticular disease? There is some sub-analysis that says that that is in fact true, but we need more either sub-analysis or more de novo studies, either real world studies like coming from Corona or Cor Evitas, which is uh, Corona's new name, um, or other ways of, of looking at that. Uh, for instance, the amount of skin disease in the real world is a BSA less than three or not at all. Or in the clinical trials, it's a body surface area of greater than three. And then she points out the whole issue of what adherence is like. We know in the real world, we talked about adherence last week on this Tuesday night rheumatology with a lecture from Caleb Michaud talking about adherence that where even RA patients going on DMARDs, you know, 50 to 60% adherence at best. And we know it's less than lupus. Uh, great adherence data I haven't seen on psoriatic arthritis, but it's gotta be the same, if not worse. But yet when you're in a clinical trial, through the frequency of visits, the coaching, the cheerleading, the monitoring, sometimes even drug levels, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot at stake for the patient, especially getting free medicine to be adherent to the drugs. So um, last note that I took down was that as great as, and the large numbers, incredibly large numbers you get with real world data, um, there is channeling bias. So why, for instance, did she show us a study about um, infection rates being the lowest with ustekinumab in the psoriatic arthritis trials? That paper from Seung Kim, um, they use they, they use ustekinumab, the twelve twenty three inhibitor, as the reference. Um, and that's very similar uh, in, to a multiple studies. Some other studies use uh, TNF inhibitors as the referent, but that's mainly because we use a lot of TNF inhibitors, but often they choose the lowest number and then anything that's worse than that as far as a risk or an observation, they put it in, in reference to, uh, in this case, ustekinumab. Now, is that because ustekinumab really is a much safer drug? 
Or is there channeling bias as to who gets on ustekinumab? Meaning milder patients, less, less severe patients. Uh, it's, it's hard to know. The same actually has been observed for the rheumatoid arthritis trials, where often when looking at infection rates, um, abatacept is the referent. The same issue there. Why they compare, Why would someone in a large data set in your practice, in my practice, go on abatacept versus going on a JAK inhibitor or a TNF inhibitor? Again, there is channeling bias that's in play there where we need to be uh, aware of. And lastly, I want to point out that these kind of data um, are not proof of principle. Although the FDA and EMA in Europe may consider them with greater import in the future, most of the experts, epidemiologists, biostatisticians say that these are the best answers you're gonna get or they are hypothesis generating. And based on this data, you should then do the double blind randomized placebo controlled trial or maybe a head to head trial as was talked about earlier. So we have a few questions already um, in play here that I wanted to um, uh, bring up. One question was about, um, um, is there a drug or targeted therapy that's better at skin and joint in PSA, assuming that other things are not in play like comorbidities, heart disease and, and whatnot. And, and I think that um, first off in PSA, we have, um, limited head-to-head -head trials to answer that question. In psoriasis, we have a lot of head-to-head -head trials to answer that question, where clearly the IL-1223s, uh, sorry, 23s uh, and 17 inhibitors are superior as far as getting POSI 90, POSI 100 scores in psoriasis only patients. In our patients, psoriatic arthritis with or without skin, the question that was very presented, um, what's better at both skin and joint, and clearly, the, again, the 17 inhibitors and the 23 inhibitors um, need to be considered as being superior to uh, a, an a, a TNF inhibitor alone, most of those studies being adalimumab, or maybe even a JAK inhibitor. Now, again, there's no head-to-head -head trials, but this is based on what's out there, okay? And again, you're gonna have to selectively choose what is the dominant issue. So we in rheumatology have no problem using any of these drugs for the arthritis, the, kind of the journal clubs that we presented last month basically showed that the responses, as far as completeness and rapidity response, is the same with the IL-17 inhibitor as it is with the TNF inhibitor. And that's kind of against what most people's thinking is. But the real difference is going to be in the skin or in the gut, either adverse risk in the gut for 17 inhibitors or potentially beneficial gut effects for uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease for the IL-23 uh, inhibitors and the 12-23 inhibitors where that's being used. So that's, I think, important um, to note. Um, another question we have is, uh, is a number of questions that were uh, sent in that were about using methotrexate before TNF and how long do you wait to go on a TNF inhibitor? And um, the algorithms do say or do prefer methotrexate first, unless there's a reason to not use methotrexate. Patient risk factors, patient proclivities, patient you know, concerns, past medical history and whatnot. And then how long do you wait to go on a TNF inhibitor? It doesn't matter whether it's methotrexate, TNF inhibitor, JAK inhibitor, 17 or 20, as soon as possible. If they have active arthritis or active skin disease, boom, DMARDs and then ask questions later. Biologic DMARDs, targeted synthetic DMARDs, um, OSM has already pointed out oral small molecules uh, that all need to be started first and, and you don't wait. So um, the delay is often before they get to you. You're the person who starts DMARDs bio and biologics right quick, right? You're the person who does that. Um, what do you think about the combination of a primalast with a biologic? And there's always a lot of questions about that. And, and what I saw at the sessions we had with on psoriatic arthritis is that everyone's behind it, but no one can show me a great paper that shows that it works. So until we see the great paper, we got to say, okay, you can do it. Now, how do you get away with this, right? Really, they're two really expensive drugs. How do you get away with using two really expensive drugs? Or the next question, a lot of another, other questions came in about combination biologics. Could you use, for instance, a you know, um, 
um, combination DVARs, a, an IL-17 inhibitor with a JAK inhibitor, or um, a 23 and a 17 inhibitor. Um, and I think you can get away with it when you can go back at the insurance payer and say, well, I'm using drug A for the skin, the horrible psoriasis, and drug B for the joints, the horrible psoriatic arthritis. You fill in the blanks on which there's drug A and drug B. Um, do you use musculoskeletal ultrasound to help determine activity and treatment choices? Um, and and I, I don't. Um, I have a ultrasound machine that's collecting dust. I know how to use it, but um, I'm not, I haven't bought into it. Many people have. Uh, I'll also say it, it really is your own opinion um, about what the importance of that. I will say this, that in, um, in the discussions um, at, at Room Now Live about refractory RA patients, 10% of all RA patients are refractory or what's called difficult to treat RA, um, the ULAR had a guideline that said ultrasound may be very important in assessing, in assessing patients who are difficult to treat disease, meaning ultrasound can be used to determine whether the person has fat fingers or actually has tendonitis, tenosynovitis, or synovitis. Uh, you know, so again, I think this also applies to patients with psoriatic arthritis. Um, a question about hyperuricemia in PSA. What does it mean? We've published on Room Now in the last uh, last week, and then a few months ago about PSA as a biomarker, a very good biomarker in patients with um, psoriatic disease, meaning it's up in patients who have worse disease, worse burden of disease, higher comorbidities, and are more difficult to treat. Why would you not measure uric acid serially in psoriatic arthritis? Yeah, I mean, psoriatic arthritis, not gout, because as you know, there is a subset of psoriatic arthritis patients who will get gout. And yes, that can be predicted by an elevated uric acid. That elevated uric acid in psoriatic arthritis could also indicate, indicate a risk of nephrolithiasis and you know, renal effects. But I think it really should be followed because it tells you a, a degree of severity. And it's one of the things that you can measure, monitor, and aim for as a target. Um, and lastly, um, there was a question from Marilyn Sols uh, Solsky that asked about, um, is it okay to use methotrexate in patients with NASH? As you know, there's a fair amount of liver disease in patients with psoriatic arthritis. And Marilyn collect correctly remembers that there was a guideline about that, except it was in the new ACR guidelines, the 2022 published uh, guidelines for treatment of RA, where it says that a patient who has stable liver disease and stable LFTs who has a history of fatty liver can safely receive methotrexate. And I think, but that only applies to RA. Would I do that for PSA? I wouldn't. And that's not been dealt with in any of the guidelines that already presented in his session. Why? Because PSA in the liver, it's a bad mix, is it not? RA in the liver, we live with it, it we're, we manage it. There's really no horrible stories there or almost no horrible stories there, but meth, but. PSA and, and, and liver disease, there's a high risk there, a higher risk. I would tend to avoid methotrexate in patients with a diagnosis of fatty liver, steatosis, NASH, any, any of those labels make me steer away from methotrexate. So if there are no further questions, I'd like to remind you about what our, our session next week, um, another Tuesday night rheumatology where we'll be covering spondyloarthritis. We've got a great um, session um, uh, led by Jose Scher talking about the microbiome in SPA, Philip Meese talking about axial psoriatic um, disease, uh, and Pamela Weiss, a pediatric rheumatologist talking about juvenile spondyloarthritis and what that means. So I hope you'll tune in. Um, again, you can watch this on the webinar through your invite that comes to your email inbox. Tell your friends that they can watch this in the live stream, either on Twitter, our YouTube channel, LinkedIn, or even Facebook. That's it for tonight, folks. Hope you enjoyed the meeting. We'll talk next week.